purse. Earlier today, the chair of the board which supervises the audits resigned for health reasons. Tonight, the Auditor General will appear behind closed doors to discuss the request for a closer look at Senate expenses. On Thursday, the auditors are taking a who are taking a closer look at Pamela Wallen's travel bills will be questioned on why they're taking so long to finish the probe. And in a not entirely unrelated development, the Ottawa citizen found at least one Conservative MP claiming personal items like toothpaste and hairstyling as campaign expenses. The Canadians have had enough paying for the Conservative pretty department. First, the Prime Minister gets caught paying his personal makeup artist and stylist out of taxpayers' funds. Then the Finance Minister is caught billing taxpayers for Maybelline and CoverGirl cosmetics trying to look good on Budget Day. Now the Parliamentary Secretary for Veterans Affairs is trying to get a taxpayer rebate for beauty products and services during the last election. Can the government confirm that the Parliamentary Secretary did not break Election Canada rules? For more than two-thirds of my personal expenses were for childcare, as I campaigned from 7 a.m. until after 10 p.m. every day. And while voters can tell you that my five-year-old son came to many doorsteps, he also had to eat and play and go to sleep at a reasonable hour. I had to keep campaigning. In fact, the media called my campaign particularly respectful, intelligent, and focused on issues, not on mudslinging. Elections Canada has very clear-cut rules and definitions of what can and cannot constitute a personal campaign expense. All campaigns, including my campaign, need to follow those definitions. Well, let's give Eve Adams credit for actually defending herself. They don't do that very often on the Conservative side. But what's the terrific Tuesday trio of MPs have to say about this and other issues percolating around Parliament? Well, let's ask him. Conservative MP James Rajat, NDP MP Megan Leslie, Liberal MP Roger Kuzner, they're all in the foyer of the House of Commons. I want to start with you, uh, Megan. Do you claim, did you claim like toothpaste and hairspray and mouthwash and traffic tickets and wash and blow dries at, this, at the hairstylist when you were on your campaign? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, but uh, should you? I mean, is, you know what? I, I don't want to pick. I don't uh, want to pick on Eve, but has she done something wrong here? No, you know what? I, I actually have got a lot, lot to say about this. Um, I think that Roger Kudzner needs a haircut, uh, but I don't think that that should actually be an issue in question period. And, and I do think that there is something, you know, this media frenzy around what Eve Adams did or did not charge um, because she's pretty, right? That's what this is all about. I mean, Glenn McGregor wrote the original story. He goes after all of us fairly and equally, uh, and he accounted for these expenses or he wrote down these expenses. Eve Adams is going to have to account for, you know, what she did or did not do and what she did or did not charge. But we have a Senate spending scandal. We have senators who can't tell us what province they live in. There are way bigger issues here than whether or not she charged a blow dry to her, her campaign. I don't think this should have been an issue for question period today. But I will Jake. say, you know, to her credit, she did defend herself. But she gives this impassioned plea about child care. Well, you know, it's nice she gets a, a tax credit for having uh, child care during the campaign when the rest of Canadian families only get 100 bucks a month. I would like to see her actually come on board with the NDP's plan for child care. I think it's a good recognition that we actually need it. Okay, Roger Kuzner, is this just a sexist attack or are there some legitimate concerns over this? Because if she's doing it, you can only assume others are doing it as well. Is a, a sexist attack because Megan said, I need a haircut? Zing! Thing. Uh, I, I listen, I, uh, the one thing that I was taken by was the fact that she took her uh, son door to door. I know that uh, you know if I ever took my three boys door to door, uh, it better be on Halloween and there better be a bag of chips at the end of the, uh, the, uh, the knocking session. Uh, you know, it, it, I, I think it goes beyond the sexist part. Uh, it, you know, these expenses were clearly beyond. I think they, they were entered uh, in a column that could push her campaign spending over. Uh, Megan makes, makes a great point on the, uh, uh, the cost of uh, child care and the fact that uh, Canadians, uh, they, they, they're eligible for $100 per month for child care and there's $1,600 in there. But, you know, she, she, um, she, she won the seat, but it, it, it seems to be the trend that the the conservative government have the, the members have played free and loose with campaigning rules this isn't the opposition parties that are that are pushing this issue 
This is Elections Canada, two years later, still trying to find out uh, facts and try to get uh, trying to get information back from from this government. We we see two that are before the courts now, so it, it's it's like uh, you know serial overspenders over there, and uh, and their compliance with Elections Canada and cooperation with election, Elections Canada. I think that's sort of the broader issue. Well, James, Rajon, I want to compliance. go to you because not many people. Not many people get all these kind of perks when they're really camp auditioning for a job or applying for a job, and that's what Eve was doing on the campaign. Do you think she was out of line? Because I want to note in the story they also talk about six thousand dollars in corrections of, of campaign expenses that were uh, repaid. So it's not like we're just talking about some hand cream and a shampoo. Well, but, but Don, I think, and as, as both you and Megan mentioned, I mean, Eve stood up in the house and actually defended herself very directly in terms of uh, the article that was printed yesterday. With respect to whether the expenses are allowable or not, I think we should frankly leave that up to Elections Canada. Elections Canada has criteria in terms of what's allowable and what's not. It, it shouldn't be for me or anyone else on the panel to decide that. That should be for Elections Canada, whether it's deemed an eligible expense or not. We should let them as, as the body make that determination. I think we should certainly respect their role there. I, I, I do want to follow up on something what Megan said. I mean, we spend an awful lot of time on issues like this. And frankly, there's an awful lot of work going on in Parliament, in my view, that's sort of being ignored. I mean, I think the three of us Thursday night were debating a uh, new national park, which was, I thought, a very interesting debate. There's, there's a lot of issues that are going on. We passed the budget bill last week as well, which obviously there's a big policy debate back and forth. Uh, but a lot of items there, and what, there's so much focus on things, as Megan said, that are frankly small in the, in the overall context of things in terms of governing the country. Well, I'm not sure. One thing that's not that small a deal, I would argue, and it has to do with, as you raise Elections Canada, Elections Canada still thinks Shelley Glover and James Bazan are in violation of their requirement to follow uh, campaign expenses in a timely manner, and they've, asked, they've actually advocated they be suspended. It's all tied up in court. Yet, lo and behold, Shelley Glover is one of five MPs that the government announced today would be vetting candidates for the next Supreme Court of Canada vacancy. I got to ask you, James, does that make any sense to you? A MP who could be suspended is actually looking into a judge appointment to the Supreme Court of Canada? But this is so the two members in question have both challenged, I mean, Elections Canada has challenged some of their expenses. There's a dialogue back and forth in terms of what's allowable or what's not. In fact, I think both of them have very strong cases in terms of what's allowable under their election expense limit. So that should be a dialogue going forward. I think the Speaker is right to say that. This should be settled out, not within Parliament, but it should be settled out with, with respect to uh, within the legal system in terms of what's allowable or not. In terms of her sitting on the committee, I sit with her on the Finance Committee. Shelley's one of the hardest working members we have in this Parliament, and I know she'll do an excellent job on that committee. And further on that, I think most people would say the process that we've initiated and put in place in terms of review of people going on the Supreme Court or judicial appointments has in fact approved the process. We have, it's an all-party committee, it interviews uh, prospective candidates, and I think most people have said the uh, people we've put forward with respect to Supreme Court nominations have been very good in part because of this new process we've put in place. Okay. I want to get your quick thoughts on that, Megan. Uh, I think this is actually really tough. Um, I think the Speaker needs to make a decision really quickly about what's going on when it comes to both Shelley Glover and James Bazan, whether or not they should be sitting in the House. Uh, because if you don't make a decision quickly, this is the kind of thing we, we see ourselves in, where, uh, you know, Shelley Glover's appointed this very important committee, but her future in the House is still left to be determined. Uh, I've worked with Shelley. I think she is a very hard worker. I don't agree with her on things, but uh, I know she would be committed to any task that was put before her. But I don't know that it's appropriate um, that she's on this committee while the jury's still out on, on whether she can continue to sit. And I think the Conservatives should have thought this one through a little more. Roger. I, well, I, I, I don't think uh, any of the great public policy institutions, any of the great public policy schools in the country will be uh, holding up uh, Prime Minister Stephen Harper's approach to appointments as, uh, uh, you know, exemplary uh, uh, samples of you know how, how to appoint people to various positions and this might be another one I, you know I respect the fact that Shelley has a, a law and order background as a as an officer uh, and I, I uh, don't disagree that uh, you know she's a hard worker but uh, just in light of what's gone on and the, and the her case being before the courts I think it uh, it sort of speaks again to uh, whether or not the Prime Minister sort of thinks these things through 
I want to quickly go something that's a major issue. Five years after the residential school apology, I'm wondering if you guys have any thoughts on whether that was sincere and if anything's been done to follow up on it. Have, have we gone beyond just being sorry? Have we actually done something? I'll start with you, Megan. Yeah, it was five years ago, and it was a tremendous thing. It was an incredible thing. The, the apology was truly historic. But where has the action been? Um, I don't know how wide the camera angle is right now that you have of me, but right behind me is, um, is a stained glass window um, commemorating that historic apology. And it's beautiful. But that's one of the only things I can actually point to in terms of outcomes, in terms of actual action, is a stained glass window. And that's not quite enough. Okay, I think we can see it when we go over to you, uh, James Rajat, uh, the stained glass in the background, if the camera angle's right. What do you think the government's accomplished since that apology? Well, I mean, in terms of the apology, I mean, it was a very moving day for those of us who were in the chamber for that event. Uh, very moving, uh, you know, from a parliamentarian point of view, but as a Canadian as well. And, and to have the First Nations on the floor of the House, which is a very unique situation. In terms of what's happened, I mean, obviously the, the Reconciliation Commission is moving forward with its work. With respect to what's being done, I mean, the government itself is moving forth legislation, whether it's respect to safe drinking water standards on reserves, investing more in education as we have in the last number of budgets, uh, matrimonial property rights in terms of ensuring that First Nations women have the same uh, rights as First Nations men do on reserves. I mean, we are moving forward in the agenda. And so we are trying to address wrongs done in the past, but we're also trying to move forward and ensure that living conditions of Aboriginal peoples improves here in Canada today. Okay, Roger Cousner, quick last word to you on this topic to wrap well, things no, up. No, I, I, I know my good friend James would want me to remind people too. It's it's also the fifth anniversary of uh, Pierre Polyev's uh, 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 statement about whether or not we're getting good value for the money with this uh, reconciliation. Uh, you know, I think the idle idle no more movement last summer spoke volumes as to where the progress has been over five years. Uh, you know, Theresa Spence's uh, hunger strike. Uh, it, it was a great gesture, it was a powerful gesture, but uh, any action after that, uh, I don't really think, uh, you know, First Nations communities have seen a lot of that. Okay, thank you all. And just a programming note, uh, you'll want to tune in next week when we launch our annual co-host series before the MPs head home for their summer holiday. This year, James, Megan, and Roger have agreed to share host duties. Oh, we can arrange yeah. it next week. Yay. Oh, this is where <laughs> we get interviewed, Don. This is a sweeps week. Together. It's, it's sweeps, sweeps week. together. Sweeps week. Yeah. 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 You'll all take my job week. away from me. All right. I want to get a <laughs> go back and get a reality check on this whole question. The Auditor General looking at the Senate. That's This is from someone who's vetted plenty of receipts and studied thousands of balance sheets for irregularities.